This is the Tom Anderson Show, your number one morning rush hour radio news show. From Anchorage through Matt Sue on KBNT 92.5 FM and 1020 AM, 6 AM to 9 AM, Alaska time. Online across the globe at TomAndersonShow.com. News, sports, weather, and the latest in politics and entertainment. Want to join the conversation? Call us now at 907-357-5868. That's 357-5868. Good morning, America. Here's Tom Anderson. Sitting in the studio today is the Managing Director for the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, Mr. Brad Keithley. Welcome back. Uh, I talked about uh, in the last segment of the last hour sort of the three big issues that I think are out there this election cycle, both in the primary and in the general election campaign uh, from a fiscal policy standpoint. One is budget size. The first is budget size. Ask your candidate what size budget, overall budget, uh, they think the state can't afford it. If the candidate sort of looks looks like the deer in the headlights, then you've really got, got to be concerned if the la- if the candidate has really thought about fiscal issues. Um, the standard I'm using is if the sta- if the candidate says about 3.75 billion, that's about the uh, that's about the size budget we can stand based upon the the revenues that we've got. Then you've got a candidate I think that's fiscally conservative and is and is going to be in there looking for budget cuts. Is going to have to be looking for budget cuts. If you've got a candidate that says, oh, what we've been doing, which is about $4.5 billion, about $750, more, $750 million more, uh, if you've got a candidate who's saying what we've been doing is good or, you know, we need to bring it down a little bit more, but we're sort of on the right track, then you've got a candidate uh, that, that frankly is, is, is thinking more about, needs to be thinking more about what revenues they're going to have to raise in order to fund that budget. Once you go above 375 dollars you're going to have to be bringing in new revenues in order to get the budget to work. Um, and, you know, frankly, you know, the legislature has defaulted to PFD cuts. Uh, maybe that's what your candidate has in mind, regardless of what they tell you about the PFD. If they think that's the size budget that we ought to have, there's going to have to be new revenues, and uh, and they may fall in line. So, hey, Brad, can I ask you a question you as sure it can. relates to that? Since you work on a, uh, a sustainable budget platform, yep. what is it? that the legislature does not understand that most of us families have to understand. And that is we work with a dollar amount, a fixed dollar amount that we know we must live within these means or we'll always be in the hole. Why can't they get it through their head that there are certain cuts that are going to be mandatory, though painful. It's painful when you got to cut your kid's allowance, you get rid of cable, you stop buying coffees out Why can't they get that through their head? It has to operate the same way. Uh, Rick, I think there's two reasons. One one is that there are a lot of forces at work. When you get down to Juneau, there's a lot of lobbyists down there, a lot of forces at work that are telling you, you can't cut this, you can't cut that, you can't cut the other thing. And, And they have a hold on various legislators. So you might get a legislator who says, okay, we can cut the university system. Uh, we've, got, we've built three universities. We can't afford three universities. We need to get back to a single university. But then you've got legislators from Fairbanks who says, no, you can't do that, um, but you can cut something else. And by the time you total up uh, all, of, all of those voices down there, there's nowhere really where you can get 21 votes in the House and 11 votes in the Senate uh, to make those cuts. You don't have – everybody will talk about making cuts – but but you can't get a consensus on where those cuts need to be made. And then the second thing kicks in. We've had a safety net in the last over the last six years since we started hitting deficits in 2014, we've had a safety net. We've had the safety net first of the of the of the statutory budget reserve, the SBR. Then that, then we've had the sta- the safety net of the constitutional budget reserve, which had about fourteen billion dollars in it when we when we started down this hole. Um, and, and so they've said, well, we'll get to it next year. Yeah, we can't reach consensus this year. We all agree it needs to be cut. You'll get these press releases from the Senate majority that say, we're going to cut 200, 300, 400 million dollars. But, but, you know, when it gets right down to it and they can't agree, they've had the safety net of, of, of going to now in the last couple of years, they've started including the PFD as part of the safety net. They're using it. I mean, I don't care what anybody tells you. What's what what's really going on is they're beginning to use the PFD as the third savings account that they're going to raid. We've taken out the SBR, we've drained the SBR, that's gone. We've cut the S, the CBR, the Constitutional Budget Reserve from about 14 billion down to 2 billion. 
that's virtually gone. You need about $2 billion of cushion if we have an earthquake, if we have a tsunami, if we have something you need some money in the bank that you can, you know, you can pull fairly fast to deal with an emergency. So people have generally said that's about two billion dollars. So we've taken the CBR down to sort of the the absolute minimum that it can go to. Now we're cutting cutting into the PFD. They've found they they've 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 talked a good game about overall cuts, but they but they haven't had somebody uh, who has has found the key to getting it getting it down to the level it needs to be. And frankly, we haven't had a governor who has who has exercised veto power or exercised mm-hmm. leadership power uh, to get it down. I think I had this conversation with somebody the other day. I think Governor Walker went wrong. Uh, where he went wrong was when he um, uh, fin- somebody came in and said, "You're gonna have to issue pink slips." Walker, in his in his business career, had never really issued pink slips, and I think confronted with the reality of having to issue pink slips, particularly with Byron sitting there in his ear saying, don't do it, don't do it. Um, I, I think that's where he blinked. Um, so you, do, you have, we haven't had a governor who's had leadership saying, we are going to have, we're going to get down to a single university. We're going to cut out having three, having three universities. Uh, we're going to, we're going to go into the K through 12 formula and we're going to, we're going to redesign the K through 12 formula uh, we're going to go into Medicaid options, and we're going to start cutting out Medicaid options. We haven't had a governor who's had the the, the leadership skills, and we haven't had a legislature who's had the leadership skills to identify those cuts, and they've had the safety nets uh, to fall back on. So I, I, that's where um, that's where I think. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. We've it's gone wrong. Formula for disaster. And to my original analogy, it's like we don't have the parent who's willing to make the hard choices with all the kids involved and say, no, I'm sorry, we're going to have to tighten our belt this way. Yeah, it's, it's been like, it, using that analogy, it's been like the kids have been in control, right? Yep. Uh, and what do they do? If Wait a minute, we, there's still, I still have checks in my checkbook. What do you mean I'm out of money? <laughs> no, I can keep writing them. Well, and you've got one kid who wants a new car. you got one kid who wants the latest N- Nintendo video game. You've got one kid that wants to go on, on a year-long trip uh, around the world, and you and you don't say no to any of them. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, well, I said yes to them. We got to be fair. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, I mean, all the way to bankruptcy. That, that's, that's, the, that's the deal. And, and so the first question you ask a legislator is what's your top, what's your bottom line number? Don't ask them where they're going to make the cuts. Get them focused on the bottom line right. number. If they don't focus on a bottom line number and that number isn't around 3.75, you're dealing with somebody who's never going to get it. And yeah. you need to be looking, looking for another Good advice. Candidate. Um, well, that's that's the advice I'm going to give for this uh, for this uh, quarter hour. In the last uh, segment, uh, last uh, uh, half hour, we've been talking to Craig Medred about fish and then the quality of uh, of Alaska reporting on election issues. What I want to dive down into one of those issues uh, that that I think has not been reported well uh, by the press. You see it you see it show up occasionally. Um, in some articles, you'll see it see it show up occasionally in some blog articles. Uh, you'll certainly see it show up on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets uh, uh, Facebook page uh, as we talk about it. But but uh, you know we only have a limited number of people who read that page, so uh, it's it's a it's an issue that I think is critically important. And it's an issue that's showing up uh, uh, this this election cycle in the Valley issue in the in the Valley elections. Uh, I'm going to be using the phrase occasionally credit card fiscal policy, and and by that I mean this generation putting uh, pushing off paying for things, pushing off spending to future generations. Essentially, this generation putting things on a credit card, uh, but then handing the credit card over to our children and saying, "You get to pay for it. I got to benefit from it uh, in terms of in terms of spending, but you get to pay for it." And that's not only uh, an issue that we face at the federal level on a, on a fairly massive scale at the federal level. It's also an issue we're facing uh, at the state level. Uh, a few years ago, uh, the legislature pushed uh, a bunch of retirement costs, PERS and TERS costs. Uh, off onto the future, and in fact, pushed it off in a way that escalates into the future, basically making uh, 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 Alaskans in 2020, 2030, 2040 uh, pay for costs that were incurred uh, uh, much earlier uh, in the in the 2000s and the 1990s. Just pushing off that obligation. This past legislature did the same thing uh, with uh, with a group of costs, the uh, oil tax credit costs. 
Uh, they're now going to, they've passed a bill to bond those costs, essentially push those costs off onto the next generation. Credit card, credit card fiscal policy to me is a big concern. Um, so as we have the conversation with Maya, don't think that this is just an issue that we're facing at the federal level. This is an issue that, uh, that has corollaries also at the state level. And I do have a question for you, not oh my to throw gosh. you off. Okay. You mentioned you know reporting. I noticed, and I haven't read the story yet, I think it may have been KTVA put out an article or a news story that AEDC believes that we have hit the bottom of Alaska's mm-hmm. recession mm-hmm. and that we should be on our way up now. Any thoughts on that, or have you checked it out? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have thoughts on that. I, I think y- y- this is one of those things – you know, sometimes people want to control the conversation or want to direct the conversation by 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 saying things, and hopefully, mm-hmm. you know, things sort of align around that. If you read the details uh, behind the behind the AEDC analysis, uh, it it's not that we have hit bottom; it's that the rate at which we're declining is slowing. Yeah, and maybe we're uh, maybe we're on our way to plateauing. I mean, I think the KTVA article even even went so far as to say that you know the recession's over. The recession's over in 2019. We're going to start to grow our way out of it. I I I just uh, that's not right. And particularly if we're putting off if if Alaska LNG is sliding back from 2024 toward the 2030 time frame, which is what we the conversation we just had with Cody. Um, I think I think that sort of is gonna is gonna even make things more difficult. Um, we do have some, as, as the Tim Bradner article that I talked about with Cody points out, we do have some positives. I mean, we have, uh, Conoco's announced some big developments Mm -hmm. on the West side of the North slope. We have other things going on on the North slope. We have some mining projects, but the big dog out there is the Alaska LNG project. That's what really brings us out. And if that's being, if that's sliding back, if the analysis of that is that it needs to slide back a little bit or will slide back a little bit, that's going to make things, um, that's going to, that's going to keep us sort of in in a trough uh, for a while longer. For you, working on the budget side of things, how hopeful are you with what you see forecasted now? We've got August looming uh, with the primaries. What do you, if you were the great predictor, what was uh, Johnny Carson's uh, character? Karnak. Karnak. Yeah, yeah, and he would hold up the yeah. envelope to his uh, yeah. uh, turbaned head. What is your prediction for what we're about to see happen in Alaska? So here, here is here is my 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 set piece on that. I I think Dunleavy wins the Republican primary, mm-hmm. um, and and goes on and and has the best chance in the general. Uh, to be very honest, though, I see a path for victory, path to success for all the candidates. I know the the conventional wisdom is that Walker and Begich will split the vote, split the quote progressive vote, and Dunleavy will will be elected as a result of that. Frankly, I think we're going to see a different split than a lot of people have predicted. If Dunleavy is the candidate, I uh, the Republican candidate, I'm I'm thinking we're going to see a significant Republican uh, Chamber of Commerce vote. Uh, the Ron Duncans of the world, the president of GCI, the Ed Rasmussens of the world. I think they go to Walker uh, because these are people who don't want to see the budget cut for various reasons. They, they think that the budget's just fine as it is, and they think the PFD cut is fine as it is. I mean, Ron Duncan's in the top 1%, so he doesn't have to – he doesn't have to uh, – uh, uh, <laughs> the percent of his income affected by the PFD cut is lost in the, in the rounding. Um, so I think, I, think, uh, I think there's a potential for – a split on the Republican side, just as we had um, in two thousand or in nineteen ninety two, when Tony Knowles was elected for his nineteen ninety four, when Knowles was elected for his first tra- term in nineteen ninety eight, when he was elected for his second term, I think we have the potential for a split in the Republican Party, which would uh, bring the uh, uh, create an opportunity for the Democrat candidate uh, Mark Begich uh, to be elected. In terms of in terms of even if Dunvey, Dunleavy's elected, does that resolve the problem? I think the answer to that is no. Um, one of the favorite things I talk about from time to time is is the budget process. The budget process, as affected by the Supreme Court decision last year on the PFD, uh, is this: the legislature appropriates. And the governor decides whether or not those appropriation levels are going to stand or whether they're going to be reduced. If the legislature doesn't appropriate a full PFD, 
There's nothing the governor can do about it. The governor can't add money to a budget. That's that's really the consequence of the Supreme Court decision. The, the, we're no, the governor, the state administration process is no longer in control of the PFD. It's up to the legislature um, each year. So I can see a situation if we don't elect a legislature that supports Dunleavy, assuming he's elected governor, if we don't elect a legislature that is absolutely in line with him in terms of cutting the budget and, and, and restoring the PFD to a statutory level, I can see a situation in which we continue to have PFD cuts because the legislature won't appropriate the money sufficient uh, to fully fund the PFD. And I see a situation in which we have a standoff between the legislature and the governor uh, over again. what over, again <laughs> over what uh, over whether we're going to have budget cuts. I mean, there you go into the you look at the legislature as we said before. There are a lot of people who talk a good game. We got to get spending down. There's places we can do additional cuts. We're going to get spending down to to long term sustainable levels. But when the rubber meets the road, they can't get a consensus on what those cuts are going to be. Yeah. And like Congress, Maya was just talking about, you know, the, the the spending bill we had earlier this year. Like Congress, what they come out with is, okay, you want that program, you want that program, you want that program, you want that program. You all say you want cuts, but you're not willing to make a cut in that program, that program, that program, or that program. You want, you, you know, don't cut me, don't cut my friend, cut that guy behind the tree. Well, unfortunately, in Congress, all the trees are represented, so so you just don't get them cut. That's what we've run into also in Alaska. We just have not had a consensus at the legislative level to make these cuts. Dunleavy made veto um, uh, uh, spending down to down to three point, let's say three point seven five, but the legislature then may very well come back and say uh, uh, that we need to, you know, that we're going to have to increase it and and override the veto. Or what I think is much more likely to happen, we're going to have we're going to have Dunleavy saying we need a full PFD, and and putting that in the budget. It's going to go to the legislature. The legislature is then going to say, "You want a full PFD? Okay. Well, you got to keep three universities. You've got to keep K through 12 funding at full levels. In fact, you need to add more to K through 12 uh, uh, funding. Uh, med- all those Medicaid cuts you you, you want to make, we're not going to make those." All those uh, ghost positions you want to cut, we're not going to cut those. You want a full PFD, you're going to play our game. The legislature is going to say you're going to play our game. And our game is we're going to feed all the children, give all the children what they want, uh, and then maybe you'll get your full PFD. So Dunleavy will respond by saying, oh, no, we're going to cut. I'm going to veto. And then they're going to say, well, we're not going to give you your full PFD until, until, you, uh, until you play our game. It is it, as important as it is to get the right governor. It is critically important. Uh, these legislative races are, are critically important uh, that we get those right. And one of the things I've, you know, I, I'm concerned about uh, the the Senate Republicans who have continued to support these spending levels, even though they say they were going to cut them. The Senate Republicans have continued to support these spending levels. I'm concerned about the, a direction this last legislature went off on. Uh, which was you know, kicking the can down the road on certain costs. We have these oil credits, oil tax credits that that were on that were on a payment schedule, um, and the state was going to pay those off in the next five years or so. Uh, all of a sudden, last legislature, the the legislature decides, oh no, we're going to go out and issue these bonds um, for over for about a billion dollars, so we can pay off all these oil credits um, uh, to the producers all at one time instead of over the next five years, the way the statute. Uh, provided, and then these, and then they, and then we're going to stagger these bonds in a way that we're really going to push the costs of paying off that program. Not over the next five years, not not over this generation that, that caused the problem. We're going to stagger these costs so they run all out into the 2030s. You know, they're going to run through the 2020s and the 2030s. Kick the can down the road, burden our our children and our grandchildren, the next generation of workers coming up, with paying off these costs. Well, the problem is. We've done that in other areas, too. I was talking about PERS and TERS, the, the retirement plan earlier. We've got a bunch of costs. We've got a bunch of payments we need to make, additional payments we need to make on PERS and TERS to clean up a problem that developed in the 1990s and early 2000s. We've kicked the can on that down the road to, to the next generation. Um, so it's not, just, it's not just looking at legislators. Are you willing to say, 
$3.75 billion is all I'm going to spend. I'm going to not going to vote for anything that goes over that. We can talk about how we're going to allocate the 3.75, but I'm not going over that. Not only do we need legislators who are willing to say that, we need what legislators who are willing to stand up and say, I'm not going to kick the can down the road also. we're good. This generation is going to pay for its share of costs. We're not going to burden future generations. Because frankly, Rick, just like the national debt, just like we were talking about with Maya, if we start kicking state costs down the road in the 2020s, we're going to have income taxes. We're going to be yeah. we're going to be through all of our all of our reserves. We're going to be through the PFD. We're going to have spent, we're going to have cut the PFD to zero, and we're going to be to, to taxes to deal with it. Yeah, exactly. Well said. Well, that's my rant, <laughs> and and it comes right toward the end of the show.